Well, we've been in the book of Daniel and we're wrapping it up this week. So um, we're launching into a new series next week, one um, that will complement our study here because we've been studying eschatology. It comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last or last things. We've been studying the end times here. And 1 Thessalonians offers a New Testament commentary, basically, on a lot of what we've been studying. And it also um, is an incredible encouragement to this church. And so we're going to gleam from some of what the Apostle Paul says while we continue to stay through the basic idea of eschatology. And then after six weeks in 1 Thessalonians, then we'll go to, uh, to Zechariah. And if, if Daniel got your attention at all, which it did for me, um, wow, it's... Just an incredible book, probably the most messianic book uh, in the scriptures. Certainly, right there with with Isaiah and Daniel. So, we'll do Zechariah this fall. All right, but today, no, uh, we're in Daniel chapter twelve. We're going to close the book. Just a little bit of review, if you can. Last week, we looked at kind of Daniel's final revelation, and a big part of that centered around a guy that we would do well to consider a preview. A com- of coming attractions, right? And his name is Antiochus Epiphany. And if there's a little confusion there, we, were, we saw Alexander the Great in the Scriptures. We'll see him in Zechariah again briefly. I figure that you don't need the Bible to research. You can research him through secular history. But he had four generals. And when he died, the four generals assumed possession of the land. Two of them were the main, the north and the south. You have Ptolemy and the Seleucid dynasty. Several generations later, out of the Seleucid dynasty, rises up this king. And what this king does is he tricks our Jewish friends. He slaughters our Jewish friends. He takes an image of Zeus and he slaughters pigs to it in the Jewish temple. And somehow, this is mind-boggling, somehow through this whole process, he deceived and tricked the Jews, some of them at least, to going along with this. And I think that's why the bulk of the chapter is about this guy, because deception is a huge theme, a huge theme. And like before, will be again. And so we saw in the bulk of chapter 11 was this Antiochus Epiphany. But then we saw at the end of 11 in verse 35, he says, yeah, but this is is all pointing to the end, to this time. Um, And the time begins in in, in the future, we're not really sure where, but at this time is again the theme in Daniel chapter 12, where we're looking at today. In Daniel chapter 12, we just want to ask two questions, and they're in verse 6 and in verse 8. And basically, as Daniel soaks in what he's been told, he, he asks, or a question is asked, that's asked of all of us, and the first one is when? When? And the second one is, what is the outcome of these things? And that's some questions that we want to look to today. So leading up to 12, once again, you have this Antichrist figure he was the, the small horn of the Roman Empire that rose up and took out the other horn and so forth and so on. He conquered the entire world, will make himself out to be both man and God. Gee, wonder where he got that. He is emulating and essentially mocking and counterfeiting the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will conquer the world and annihilate many. But they don't go along with it. So what you saw is as he goes towards Egypt and Ethiopia, he hears rumors of troops coming down from the north, and so in verse 44, he turns around, he goes back, and this world conflict sets the stage for the battle of Armageddon. And it appears that his cohort, which is the false prophet who tries to emulate the Holy Spirit, sends out a spirit of deception, and suddenly all these armies get together to fight the Antichrist, and they collectively turn and join him, and here comes Jesus, and the battle is over. The battle is over. It ends right there. So, the outcome, verse, chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people. And again, Michael's assignment as one of the big wigs of the angelic realms is to protect Israel. So, he has been quite busy since God plucked Abram out of nowhere and built this nation, a nation that it desperately needs Michael because it has been under attack and will continue to be under attack. Um, he says, there, there will be a time that never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who's found written in the book, will be rescued. And we've talked about that. The book of life. Is your name in the book of life? Perhaps it's a metaphor. I don't know if when you get there, there'll actually be a book opened up, but it very well could be. We take the text literally. Is your name written in the book of life? How do you get your name in the book of life? 
Well, you put your faith, that is your confidence and your trust in Jesus Christ, and it is written in the book of life. It cannot be erased from the book of life because it was actually written in the book of life before you were twinkling in mommy's eyes. It's from eternity past. It's powerful. I know it's hot, guys. Sorry, our air conditioners are cranking just as much as they can. Um, but the end, at the other side of that, uh, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake and these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Not a lot on the doctrine of hell in the Old Testament. Many times it's almost ambiguous with the grave, but that is probably exactly what he's talking about here. It's not a popular topic. It's not something I enjoy talking about, but the reality is, is there is a little destination, a literal destination of every soul on this planet, every soul. If your name is written in the book of life, you are a Christian, you will be forgiven, if you're not, then that is what awaits you. Um, so if you, if you have a pulse and you're still alive, you still have a chance to put your faith, your trust, or your confidence in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And then your name would be in that book of life. There's some more in there down to verse 4. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words, seal up the book until the end of time. He says, many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others were standing on the bank of the river and on the bank, uh, the other uh, on the bank of the river. He goes on and then he asks the question we're posing today. And one said to the man dressed in linen, who is above the waters of the river, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? In other words, that famous question that we all want to know is when? When is this going to happen? Well, you could take I-10 or I-40 East and find a couple billboards to give you some direction on that. I and mean, you see no, no shortage of that. I think they're on a slide here. Um, people have been trying to predict the end times and the return of Jesus forever. I understand that probably the most predominant, outstanding prediction was by Sir Isaac Newton, and he says in the year 1260. Um, can you advance the slide? The next one. There you have it, right? Uh, missed that one. But this, this was popular for a while. This stuff is going on and it has been going on. And you go to the next one, it's the same thing. These things are kind of all over the place. But nevertheless, in, in kind of pointing out, Christians get caught up in this and it creates an awkward moment. Look at the next one. Oh, that was awkward. Yeah. Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. That billboard was put up because as Christians... One smooth-talking guy comes up with some mathematical theory. We would be lured by that? I, actually, the best commentary is not a billboard. It is the Lord Jesus because he spoke of the things that Daniel wrote about, and then he gives us an awesome commentary. So if you're following along in your Bibles today, I'm going to look at Matthew chapter 24. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, it's important to understand the context. This is the week between, we call it the Passion Week. It is the week between when Jesus rode in uh, on the donkey and the time he was arrested and crucified, and he went through a number of events. Now, as his disciples begin to become aware that this kingdom is not coming like the way they thought that he is leaving, they begin to ask some of the same questions that we ask. So, in Matthew chapter 24, let's take a look. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple building to him. So they're essentially making small talk, perhaps. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one of the stones here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And what he's talking about here, if you recall our study in Daniel chapter 9, the people of the prince who is to come, and we know that was from the Roman Empire, are going to flood the city. This was fulfilled in 70 AD. And if it's possible to fathom stones the size of cars almost, carved to immaculate perfection, weighing thousands of pounds, that somehow they managed to stack these things in the temple. When the Romans invaded, they found a way to burn the bricks, to lighten them, and to push them off. And if you were to go there today, read this passage, look at those stones, and let the Word of God get your attention. The stones are still there. So in a sense, if we're going through some chronology here, we could check a box that has happened. More discussion on that perhaps another day. But that's the Roman Empire invading, as Daniel said they would. 
As he was sitting, verse 3, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will, be these, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and at the end of the age? Right? Very logical question. Okay, we're seeing the program here. They're beginning to realize there will be two advents, and they ask the question, when? And it's, again, it's a question we all answer are all ask and don't necessarily get the answer. But how often when an end time study is going forth and everybody wants to know when and we want to look at the newspapers and look at the news and find out when, but you know what Jesus responds with? A caution about deception. It could not have been more perfectly placed. If we were to go back and understand what we saw in Daniel chapter 11, where literally this figure rose up and went to the people of Yahweh, his chosen, his elect, special people, and somehow through smooth talking and through deception, he got them to go along with the idea that we would sacrifice a pig to Zeus in the house of God. Deception. It has been going on since Genesis. Did God really say Eve was deceived. And the crazy part is, of all the things that we talk about going on in our life, and perhaps sometimes we do, we get frustrated with our own sinful disposition, our own decisions, our attitudes, attitudes of others, whatever it might be, I think sometimes we fail to stop and realize deception. Deception. It is one of the most powerful things because somebody who's right or thinks they're right, or knows they're right, and they're deceived, is about as dangerous a situation as you could find yourself in. Don't be deceived. And I'm opening up the application here a little bit, because it can come in any number of fronts. So before you're going to discuss or get into end times, Jesus is as a caution for you, watch out for deception. And as a church, we're not immune to that. In our marriage, Child parenting, we're, we're not immune to deception. It's far easier to deceive you and then watch you walk, go 100 miles an hour the wrong direction than it is to beat you with something if you're going the right direction. Anyway, let's look at more of what Jesus has to say. See to it that no one misleads you. And then he gives more information on that. He says, for many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ and will mislead many. One of the key ways that the misleading or the deception will happen is that people will claim that they are the Messiah. When you see Christ, be reminded that is not His last name. That is His title. That means the Anointed One. That's the Messiah from the Old Testament. And we sit here today and go, well, we don't know of anybody who claims to be the Messiah. Well, actually, we just passed the, uh, I think, the 20-year anniversary of that, that mess in Waco, Texas. And they interviewed one of the guys who was maybe did a little jail time or got acquitted. All the evidence burned. It's hard to prove who's shooting who, right? So, we're at, uh, something wrong? Yeah, that's fine. Um, but there has been over 60 prominent Jewish figures in Israel's history since Christ that either claim to be the Messiah or their followers claim this person was the Messiah. And then if you broaden that out a little bit, the central figure in anointed religion, how many false religions... I mean, with respect, our, our, our Latter-day Saint friends have a completely different version of Jesus. That would be categorically a false Messiah. That, so you see, this is not just, oh, he claimed to be Jesus. Well, broaden your thinking when you see something like this. The stuff was going on then, and the stuff is going on now. The goal of it, deception. Because you can call him whatever you want. If it's not the God of the book, you've got the wrong Jesus. You've got deception in play. And then it gets really interesting here. Verse 6 and 7, he said, You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened, for those things must take place, but that's not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. So we have to ask our question, what did he mean by that? Well, there is some sanctified uh, conjecture here, if you will, but wars and rumors of wars is probably relatively, okay, yep, yeah, there's always been wars. My goodness, the Jewish people have been at war since they became the Jewish people, so there's nothing new there. But when you see that phrase, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and it is out of Isaiah chapter 19 and something out of Second Chronicles, which linked those two events to a global war. 
So it became an idiom for our Jewish friends. I left the notes in my office, but there's a couple sources from rabbis that wrote before Jesus Christ ever walked the face of this earth, and they linked those events from Isaiah into a worldwide conflict. Have we had a worldwide conflict? Yes, we have. In fact, worldwide World War I, World War II historians would tell us it's the same war. A lot of historians would link the two wars together because a resolution, a proper revolution, never was found. And interestingly enough, both of those wars, or if we can call them World War I, World War II, greatly impacted the nation of Israel. After World War I, the need, the Zionist movement, if you will, was birthed. After World War II, when Hitler killed millions and millions of Jews, the world said, you know what, they need to be back in their land. I don't know if all of that was necessarily a positive take on this. There could have been some anti-Semitism involved there as well. But lo and behold, after World War II, the need was recognized and our Jewish friends got their land back in part. Fascinating. World War I and World War II. Is that what Jesus is talking about? It's probable, what we can't say with absolute certainty, but it certainly should get our attention because the links of events in the last century and a half following World War I and World War II are relatively powerful. And it talks about there will be famines and there will be earthquakes. There have been dozens and dozens of millions of people that have perished in famines over the years. They were there before Jesus and they're there now. So we don't necessarily get tons and tons of insight other than, yeah, we can look at these famines and we go, it's happening. And all of these things are not, oh, he's here. These are what's called birth pangs, right? If you've had a, a mother who's pregnant, she's getting close and she kind of knows it because she's feeling things and pangs and all sorts of stuff. And that's really what this is talking about. But the earthquake one, this one I found really interesting. Earthquakes. In the 14th century, they actually did track these. In the 14th century, there was 157 recorded earthquakes. In the 15th century, 174. In the 16th century, there's 253, 278. In the 18th century, 640 recorded earthquakes worldwide. In the 19th century, now mind you, we're still on horses here, people. This is not modern day but they managed to record 2,100 earthquakes. Fast forward to the 20th century and beyond, thousands and thousands. Now, technology does come into play here. I understand that, so we don't want to um, get too carried away with some of these things. But nevertheless, the earthquakes have been rising. In fact, corresponding right around the time of World War I, in 1905, there was 19,000 people killed in India. In 1906, in Chile, there's 20,000 killed. 1908, in Italy, 70 to 100,000 people. 1915, in Italy, 30,000. 1970, Indonesia, 15,000. 1927, in China, 100,000. 1932, in China, another 70,000. There's 30 more, I won't bore you. There's 30 more significant earthquakes that have happened between 1932 and today with at least 10,000 dying and as high as 200,000 dying. The point is this. We can go back into the ancient writings and we find them writing about eclipses. We find them writing about the king of the south's daughter, Cleopatra. They wrote, it's there. There is no indication at all that there was earthquakes, the magnitude of what has come into place in the 20th century. It's just not in their writings. The archaeological archaeological evidence, the geographical evidence. We don't go and uncover cities and find them to have been utterly destroyed by an earthquake, despite having been built with clay. It's not there. Does this and should this have our attention? I think it should. Are we wrong on the World War I, World War II earthquake connection? I don't know with certainty. And as we study end times, there's two things that we want to remember. One is that we want to be theologically generous and theologically gracious with contrasting viewpoints because part of deception is being adamantly convinced that you are right and everyone else is wrong. 
that would be problematic. Nevertheless, these are not my findings. These come from very reputable scholars, and this information is there. So to ignore it would be almost as irresponsible as allowing yourself to be deceived into thinking that the way that we're going to interpret this is absolutely right and everybody else is absolutely wrong, even though they are. No, okay. But we want to be gracious. And then at some point, you have to, in studying these things, you have to pull out what I'm going to call a mystery box. And the mystery box is a humble way of saying, look, all these things are lining up. All these things come from a literal understanding of the text. We aren't allegorizing. We aren't spiritualizing. We aren't saying, well, that's just a picture of this, or that's not what it means. We want to stay literal whenever we can. But nevertheless, because we're thousands of years remained, because we're not perfect people, and because some people have agendas that affect our thinking, any number of reasons we could be misinterpreting these things. So we have a mystery box. And in that mystery box, I likened it before to auto shop. Remember in the seventh grade, you come up with a small engine and you partner up with a guy and you rip it apart and you rebuild it and you're convinced you nail it, it's perfect. You set it aside and you look in the box and there's a bracket and a bolt and a little thing that goes in the carburetor. <clears throat> thought I had it all figured out. Look, any theological system dealing with this end time stuff, there's going to be one or two verses, one or two things that you go, you know, I'm okay with that being in the mystery box. I'm going to humbly and graciously pursue God. And I, I write dog bones in the margin of my Bible. I'm just going to chew on that one. I'm not sure, 100% sure all the time. So I have a mystery box and I have dog bone verses. And there's nothing wrong with that. So, you know what? Slot that in the mystery box and just go, hmm, very interesting, could be. Let's continue on to some of what else he has to say about the earthquake. He says, these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. He says, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. So some of this stuff is going on. At that time, many will fall away. They'll betray one another. They'll hate one another. And you know what? Some of that is happening now. I think what we need to realize as we work through this is we're working through time. Verse 1 happened in 70 A.D. We're getting to the point now where these events have not yet happened. So we're going from past to present, but some of the birth pains. So people falling away, all of these things, once we really enter into it, it's going to go into full steroid mode. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. False prophets will arise and mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But those who endure to the end... He will be saved. Interesting in verse 13, I'm trying to limit the size of our drink of water here this morning. <laughs> I know we took a big gulp last week, but he who perseveres to the end will be saved. There is a doctrine, a prominent doctrine in Christianity, and be identified as a doctrine called the perseverance of the saints. And what the perseverance of the saints says is that if you're really a Christian, you will persevere in one form or another all the way to the end. And so whether that's true or not, that's not what the context is talking about. I personally, I would prefer to have said preservation of the saints because I believe you're, you know, you're preserved, but I don't think all Christians persevere. I think some fall away. They fall into deep carnality God is faithful to them even when they are not faithful to Him. Once again, the mystery box, was that person ever a Christian? I get it, but that is not what this verse is teaching. What we have to realize now is we have, in Jesus' writing, advanced into the tribulation period. We saw in the book of Daniel that tribulation period will be started with a peace treaty. The peace treaty is fascinating, too, because although Jesus doesn't mention it in the timeline here, in order for Israel to enter into a peace treaty, they cannot be a fragmented and scattered Jewish nation all over the world. So what do they need to enter into a treaty? Well, the authority to enter in it. They need a government. They need a country. They need their land. 1948, there you go. Some would say, well, not so quick, because they didn't even control Jerusalem then. How can you make a deal in this surrounding the sacrificial system they want to reinstitute when they don't have the rights to the Temple Mount? 1948 did not give them that. 1967 did. Everything, in other words, is in place. But he who perseveres till the end, one of the greatest responsibilities that I take on myself as a pastor here is to continue to encourage and shepherd and guide us. Why? Because I think it's entirely possible that believers fall away. 
And I don't want to write them off with the doctrinal system by saying, oh, it's impossible for any true Christian to fall away. No, no, it's not. Perseveres to the end in context. It would be the end of the tribulation period, and we'll look more at that in a minute in Daniel. But then he says also in verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations then the end will come. We do not want to stand here today and see Jesus can't come back. I am a missionary at heart. When I got into pursuing missions and cross-cultural church plantings, the numbers were roughly 6,300 languages in the world, half of which have zero, zippo, nada, not one verse of Scripture, not one Christian who speaks that language. Half of the world's nations were unreached. Today, now it's probably closer to maybe a little more than a third. That is a lot of progress. Nevertheless, does the church usher in the return of Jesus Christ by completing the Great Commission? It's tempting because you can challenge more people and get them out there. But I don't think that's what's being said either. I think what's being said here, and we're not going to study necessarily Revelation and look at it, but you, the end of the tribulation period a resounding gospel proclamation, probably by some specific 144,000 Jewish people, so forth and so on, will take place before the end comes. The gospel will be proclaimed. In every time and in every era where man was assigned something by God to our chagrin, there has not been a generation that nailed it. Let's just put it that way. Are the angels going to finish the Great Commission? Entirely possible. But none of these things necessarily nail down that Jesus can or cannot return. Until, verse 15, he talks about the abomination of desolation. At this point, we're in the second half of the tribulation period. So there are things that are not in place for his physical return to reign on earth. One of them is a temple. Everything is set. The birth pains are all there, but the temple is not. Is this the end of the discussion? It's not. Because if we were to move just to the next evening, it could have been Tuesday they had this discussion, this could have happened either Wednesday night or this could have happened Thursday night, but there is another discussion that takes place regarding the end times, and that is in John chapter 14, if you could advance that slide there for you. He has to comfort them. Some of this stuff is getting really rough, and this is a discussion they had in John chapter 14. It says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hmm. Does that sound the same as the events we saw in Matthew chapter 24? It would be like this. Have you ever been to just an awesome, awesome, beautiful wedding? Somehow they almost all come together as beautiful. They, they really are. Weddings are awesome. The verbiage here is from a Jewish wedding. The groom, let's just take Mary and Joseph as an example. The groom would inherit his land. He would go and he would prepare a place for his bride. He would then, when he's ready, he would come for her. He wouldn't come all the way back. He would summon her to come to him. They'd have a feast and a celebration and then they would go to where the groom had prepared. That is what the imagery is here. This is a wedding. Have you ever seen a crime scene? A violent homicide crime scene? I've been to a couple. Not pretty at all. If you want to take Matthew 24, there's your crime scene. The return of Jesus Christ where people are stomped on. Sorry, his word. I didn't write this. Unbelieving world is stomped on and destroyed like wine in a wine press and cast into everlasting contempt. I kind of wish it didn't say that. It does. We're not going to deviate from it. That's a bloody, disastrous, ugly, nasty crime scene. And to take the issues in Matthew 24 that are being discussed and to tie them into John 14 and to say those are the same events, you're comparing a brutal crime scene to a beautiful wedding. They're not the same. The purpose of John 14 is him talking about coming to get us to take us to heaven. That is not what's being talked about in Matthew chapter 24. And we saw that last week in the book of Revelation when Jesus stomps out Armageddon, and lo and behold, the saints are with him. And I will begin to unpack this doctrine a little bit more in the coming weeks that we affectionately refer to as the rapture. It is a doctrine that is not 
popular. If Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins and the whole left behind thing 20 or so years ago made it popular, Christianity has completely rebelled against that concept. There are many today now who says there is no rapture. It's simply going up and coming right back down, and it's all the same events. And I, I, I just beg to differ, and we'll look more at that in our study of First Thessalonians. So we have two things. Some of the issues in the book of Matthew, this, the pieces are not in place yet. They're coming together. All the pieces we looked at in Matthew are coming together. In fact, if we go back to the book of Ezekiel, all the prophets prophesied about the Jewish people returning to their land. In Ezekiel chapter 20, it says, As I live, declares Yahweh God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. In other words, no matter what it takes, Israel, I, Yahweh, will be king over Israel. That is fulfilled in Yahweh incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. He says, I will bring you from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you've been scattered. They scattered in 70 AD when a flood of Roman soldiers came in and began to kill people and destroy their temples. They bolted. They took off and have been scattered into Europe, into Russia, all over the world. I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. And this is how the Antichrist thinks he's winning, but God is using the Antichrist to purge and draw and discipline Israel into faith with him. That's the judgment there. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares Yahweh God. All the prophets speak about Israel returning and God himself reigning over them in the person of Yahweh and the person of Jesus Christ, and they do so in such a way that it's kind of perhaps unfortunate our English translations don't capture, but it's done in such a way that there's an article and it's singular. So there's a temptation to say, oh yeah, but everything that's happening today, it could all get wiped down and we could start everything over. Maybe, but you got a lot in your mystery box with that view, because all of the Jewish prophets spoke about the return of the Jewish people in the Hebrew singular specific. That means one time. And when that nation was reinstituted in 1948, they are going back by tens and thousands every year, returning to their land. The stage is set. They're being gathered in unbelief to be purged and refined and brought to faith. Uh, you realize at some point here you got a front row seat? We do. We have an absolute front row row seat. What is the second question? Back to Daniel here. Daniel chapter 12, verse 8. As for me, I heard, but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? So you, you kind of look at the when and you go, well, what is the outcome? What is God doing here? Well, a huge part of it, of course, is he is ushering in for the first time a proper functioning Judaism. Judaism has been a mess for quite a while. You can read the Sermon on the Mount. That was what Jesus says true biblical Judaism should have looked like. And look at our Jewish friends and go, gulp. <laughs> oh, we're no better. We're no better. But he hasn't had that yet. He will get that. He will purge and he will draw his people in the end time. He says to Daniel, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged, purified and refined. But the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. Jesus said something similar once. He said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, do you really want to study? Do you want to know God? Do you want the truths of this word? Or you just kind of check out, go through the motions, somebody feeds you some theological system, and lo and behold, deception again. Don't be deceived. Have the insight. Take the time. Study the word. Know what he's talking about. And that is done best in community. But then he gives us more. He says, from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Now, if you did the math on the second half of this tribulation period, you would realize, well, wait a minute, it's only 1,260 days. There's an extra 30 days here. Somebody get the mystery box. What happens in that extra 30 days? Well, let's, let's put that on hold for a minute because then he says, 
How blessed is he that who keeps waiting and attains to the 1335th day. That's 75 extra days here. It offers some possibilities, but the scriptures are not dogmatically clear on what happens in these 75 days. One, this earth is a complete disaster. It's a homicide scene. Weddings happened. We're at the homicide now. Simply be we need some time to clean this up. We elect a president in November, doesn't take office in January. I don't want to oversimplify it, but maybe there's a period of time there where we're cleaning up and preparing for Jesus to take his seat. Before we do that, we're going to celebrate at a wedding feast of the Lamb. Now, I believe we are going to judgment as Christians upon this removal of the church. We'll look more at that, but there's a banquet feast, and it appears to me, at least as I study, that that feast takes place right here on earth. And the reason for that, and we're not going to look at it, sorry I'm mentioning it, but is because people are excused. You're not part of this. You step outside. If he's in heaven, that, that, that parable just doesn't make any sense to me. People will be excused from that event. There will be unbelievers that survive this 1335th day, and I believe there will be Christians who will be asked to step outside because of unfaithfulness at this wedding feast. Does not mean they're not Christians. I know I just opened a can of worms, close it, back to our study. <laughs> the 1335 days connects back to Matthew 24, 13. He who perseveres to the end will be saved. That's what it's talk talking about. It's not talking about your cardinal cousin, son, daughter, nephew. It's talking about the end of this brutal time frame. The end will be saved. What do you do with that? I mean, this is powerful truth. We're on the front row of this stuff. Well, let's go with what Daniel's told. Well, Daniel is probably sitting there going, huh, what in the world? He's been told, this is stuff for the end, Daniel. You write it. You lived it. You fulfilled your calling very well, sir. <laughs> you did. And that's kind of the final admonition in the book of Daniel. But as for you, go your way to the end. You will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Dude nailed it. From the time he was 15, 16 years old, taken into captivity, got these revelations, faithful to the end. What an incredible figure he was. He asked questions. He doesn't have answers. In the end, Daniel, you recorded it. You did what you were supposed to do. You'll get the full painted picture at the resurrection in the future. And I... I got to proclaim this verse the last two funeral services. I did the same thing. I absolutely love it. Brother, sister, you nailed it. You did good. You rest now. Their body's resting. Their spirit's really stoked and with Jesus, but you know what I mean. How about us? How about us? How about your allotted portion? Do you give much time thinking about that? Romans chapter 8 talks about it. Either being a Christian or actually ruling and reigning with Christ Revelation chapter 3, if you could bring that final slide up. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. The future is awesome. You stop and think. We, we do. We teach justification, which is really righteousification by faith. The righteousness that anybody here ought to be excited about is not yours. It's not a verb. It doesn't come from a list of anything you do. It is a noun. It is a thing. It is gifted to you. You have gifted righteousness. No one's taking that from you. There's no example of anybody losing their salvation, getting their name written out of the book of life, any of these things. Nevertheless, he's talking about something different. You were made in his image for royalty, just like Adam was to take dominion, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, take dominion, Adam, that dominion will return. And that is part of what the outcome of this will be. God incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, dwelling with man again, not just as lowly servants, which would be perfectly fine, but sitting on his throne right next to him. Wow. But I have a homework assignment for you as we wrap up our time today. There's warnings, repeated warnings 
about you forfeiting that aspect of your Christianity, that aspect of your salvation. So what is our takeout? Bring that up for me there on the next slide. Our Sunday takeout today. Guys, if we are not absolutely in the know with the narrative part of this story, then we are vulnerable to deception. I, I don't see any other way around it. And then the second thing is, you look at Daniel and you go, you know what, Daniel? Dude, you, you nailed it and I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm on real solid ground. Homework assignment today is to go through and read Galatians chapter 5 in verse 19 to 21. I, I just referenced it a little bit here. Actually, you could throw the next slide up if you wanted. It's up there if you're not familiar with it. It lists a number of things that may or may not be in your life. And at the end, it does not say, therefore, you're not going to heaven. It says you will not inherit. As a possession, you will not sit on that throne with Jesus. There is a difference. If there's no difference, then every difficult and tough thing that Jesus or the apostles ever said was simply another way to churn the gospel until it turns to milk. They never got any deeper. Of course they did. We're not talking about heaven here. We're talking about the final outcome, the final reign of God's people with God. That's what we're talking about. So, quiet time this week, work through Galatians and see if any of those sins are predominant in your life, you run the risk of, of going to Esau. He traded food, food for his birthright, temporal pleasure something to think about. We have closed our series in Daniel. I hope it was as good for you as it was for me, and I will look forward to next week and getting together as Compass Church, and we'll begin our study of 1 Thessalonians, where we once again will look at the rapture. Lord, we just thank you so much for your faithfulness. I pray that we would be faithful to you, not to earn eternal life. It has been gifted to us, but rather that we might be found faithful in your kingdom, sitting at your side and what exactly that looks like is kind of another mystery, but I want us to be excited about it and look forward to those days. May we look at your word and respond accordingly, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.